Hi, girl. You gonna sit on my lap? Go ahead. Come on. I get around mine. Come on. <laughs> she was just sitting on a chair, too. Yeah, I saw her sitting. Oh, there she comes. I saw your videos. Ah, uh, you're heavy. Oh, you're heavy. She just loves humans. I can see that. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you're messing with these guns. We went through all that whole story. Mm -hmm. You started getting into Tesla. Started reading your dad's encyclopedias. That was very gave me some insight to follow that path. And so what, what interest? What, interesting. Well, what, yeah. What was interesting about Tesla's work that you read about that you were interested in? I was interested in Tesla's as well as Steinmetz, the high voltage aspect. The high voltage aspect. And the I need unusual electrical machinery that they did use. They, but it's all created, stuff that they made. Stuff they made. Um, they had to make most of it. I mean, that's I at that time, right? Tesla's time. Tesla made everything he, everything he worked on. Uh, well, some of the stuff the Westinghouse would make too, and he'd use it again. Okay. And luckily for these scrapyards, I found vintage stuff turn of the century that was actually even some of Tesla's patents. That'd be pretty, that'd be pretty cool. Oh yeah, I was impressed when I found some of those items in the scrapyards. And they, the scrap people got to know me so well, they put these things aside for me and donated it to me, actually. They knew you were good for it. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. Yeah, yeah it, was, uh, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. And um, when moving into industrial spaces, I, again, the basement got very heavy. And then I moved from there. Uh, the U.S. government got involved with me. I wasn't promoting hey. anything. This, people heard about this. It came trickling down. What, what, what did they hear about? Uh, the levitation stuff. So you were doing that in your basement? In yeah. this basement laboratory? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you went from the basement laboratory to these more... Because you said you had an industrial space. I would say it has to be on the side of this place here. Probably about 10... I think it was 10,000 square feet. The U.S. government paid for it. For it. Uh, headed by Colonel Alexander and uh, General Bert Stubbledean and, and right up in close to Reagan somehow. Wait, l let's go back for a second. In your yeah. basement, yeah. you were doing these experiments. You were getting levitation? I was getting minor levitation. Okay, so what equipment did you have at that time? Oh, I had a lot of it. Uh, a Tesla coil, sandy graph generators, uh, Gigantic spark generators and stuff like that. Gigantic spark generators? Yeah. How big? Yeah. That's how big the arc was? No, the arc. Uh, how about that big? Yeah. Were they just condenser coil generator? Mostly capacity to build that discharge. Okay. <laughs> um, but you were using but but you were using radio equipment in your yeah, in was, your basement lab. That's correct. Um, stuff would look like this maybe. And Secret. you were generating the frequencies. Yeah. Still using dummy loads. Yeah. So, so how would the antenna work with that dummy load? Would you would just wrap a wire around oh, your? No, I just need a little bit of energy to come out so far. Okay. So you so <laughs> so so I, I want to get I want to I'm confused myself in a way. I want to make sure I understand how you do the antennas because I was always curious. Like for instance, let's say you had a uh, let's say you had a wire and a dummy load in your transmitter. You would just use that wire. Yeah. As your transmitter. Yeah, raw energy, like if I have fire up this unit. Uh huh. Oh, where did I put a music going on here? Ugh, 50 watts, 30 watts, 50 watts transmitter, really. Okay. And if I use the full length antenna, of course, I'd be broadcasting all over the place, so illegally. So yes. So we use a, something like a short antenna, it wouldn't be. So basically, the antenna would give you this space. Mm -hmm. This wire would give you this space that you would set up the levitation experiment in? Basically, yes. Okay. And then you had that surrounded with Tesla coils. And you were just... So, st okay. And then a wooden test area, usually. A wooden test area? Yeah. I mean, I... The metal wood. Did you ever have the wood deform and go crazy? The wood was always pretty... happy, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, no, two pieces blew up. Okay. <laughs> that happened. George Hathaway's got that. I guess he does. Anyway. Okay. Uh, so I'm doing this spark, this sort of jump back where I'm doing the spark stuff, observing sparks. Okay. <clears throat> I thought that kind of cool. Yeah. 
They are. I do that. And then I hear little noises. What's that? And other things. And I turn away to her, and on occasion she stopped moving around. I said, I guess that's what's happened with high tension. These weird things like that. I didn't oh. think anything was going to be interesting. So what? Yeah, so, you, so it was just kind of like, yeah. And, yeah, I mean. <laughs> cool, but it, what's next? Well, what's. You know, <laughs> that would happen, and maybe we could pick up strange things too. But. So I, I mean, high tension, you know, high voltage, you see a lot of crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. was it with just high voltage, you can do phenomenons to work. I thought it was related to it. And okay. It's in, a, in Vancouver at a meeting, and a friend of mine, we think they've been a lecture on nucleonic energy and stuff like that. So we're sitting there, and uh, he's going on and on and on. And the audience kind of left him, and I was sitting there and just asked him a few questions. <clears throat> and then I mentioned about the effects that were happening. He got very excited. He said, well, can I uh, get your phone number and address? I can come over and take a photo. I said, if you want to. <laughs> I don't know why you want to, but, you know, but he did come over. So my buddy and I, were, I just turned on all the machines and we sit up, my buddy and I sit up in the other part of the basement. He'd go in there and start taking pictures. So could you, so, and, and how would you get a picture of that? Would you have to snap it when it's moving? Yeah, that's what he did do. Okay. He put him in, later on he put it in the book. Okay. That he claimed was his <laughs> stuff, but. Nice. Through him, because he liked to brag and talk a lot to other people, word leaked out to Alex Pizarro, then that leaked out to George Hathaway. Because I was guarding my, um, taking care of my parents' house when they were on vacation, actually in Oregon. And Mel felt I showed him the stuff to Mel Winfield. But over Alex Pizarro, and Alex Pizarro interviewed me and talked about stuff and stuff. And for several hours, and he went away, and I said, I don't know why they're all acting weird about this, you know, to my friend. Next thing you know, I'm, I'm visited again by Pizarro and then George Hathaway. And they're trying to say this is very important. And it's getting all these bent up metal pieces. And I was actually throwing them in the trash can. I can't, can't use them for anything. <laughs> You've ruined them. Pizarro. <laughs> yeah, Pizarro would go out in front of Mrs. Murphy's house, going through the garbage cans, picking up metal pieces. <laughs> I said, well, what good are they? You know, I, I really wasn't in it. What was your interest then? Because you you're saying? No, no, like you see these phenomenons, or now that you would see them, call them phenomenons or whatever, but you were interested in what? Most of the antique uh, engineering I did on how they had functioned. I wasn't okay. interested in any other stuff too much. So you were interested in the machinery and how it worked? Yeah. And that just happened to be a side effect? Side effect. Major side effect. <laughs> major, major side effect. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I need mean, chi. Um, so they they uh, brought um, Washington State University came up, took um, pictures and stuff. And I think this wee weird Pizarro kid said, "No, this is very important." Pretty sexy. <laughs> and then George started saying the same thing, and then uh, S A I C came up. Military contractors down from San Diego. You were still all in your ba basement. Yeah, and they, they see stuff. Okay. And then um, others come up. George would be filming what they'd be seeing because he had a motion moving picture camera. Old, uh, yes. Eight millimeter eight, real eight, roll. Yeah. Yep. My, so, dad's, my dad still uses his. <laughs> so I'm doing my stuff. George is filming what I'm doing and, and seeing the effects and filming it. As well as the other scientists were quite excited about it. And I actually got video of that that Ian got from George through a lot of good persuasion some years ago, where they're examining the sample. Mm -hmm. There's a president of Hypertronics in New York and a secretary. So as things happened, then the US government got involved. And did they tell you why they were interested? Yeah, actually, they did. <laughs> 
Colonel Alexander sat me down and said, well, this is, okay, after I moved out of Lynn Valley into this industrial space, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I reset the lab up. With their, with their, they said they, they gave you what you needed to set the lab up. I had, no, I had all my own stuff. Okay, so, so you went from the basement team. lab to your own industrial space. Yeah, okay. uh, I, we, George Hathaway and I set it up ourselves with the military. Okay. And Los Alamos scientists okay. would come with their own video equipment and scientists. And we did. We were on one of the first in the Star Wars program, I'm told. My lawyer got involved to make sure that I'm okay. And uh, so we got things going and did a number of testing, which was all recorded in film all the time. And they were doing all kinds of unique measurements. Trying to measure the fields, yeah, trying to measure the... About, they were using lights, the lights would glow they put it <coughs> against the ceiling or on the floor. And like they're finding using, like hot spots or something? Exactly. Like, like nodes of waves and things like that? Yeah. And Colonel Alexander was using a Geiger counter. And he'd pick up the nodes of waves and put an X on the floor. No, <laughs> really? Yeah, I don't know. That's... Uh, <laughs> Masking tape. <laughs> Hot spots. They don't stand yeah. here. Yeah, they had it all mapped out. Oh, so they were, were they trying to map where these propagations were going? Yeah. But at that time, were you still using dummy loads, or did they allow you to broadcast a little more? Doing what? You mentioned, you know, you're always using dummy loads. Yeah. At that laboratory, no, were you I allowed to... Into, no, I were you allowed to... Spectrum out and on there, yeah. Single generators like that. Yeah, but were you allowed to transmit mm -hmm. higher power further? Mm, At that stage, you're still doing dummy loads. I kept it in DOC, DOC um, recommended. Okay. It was all low power. So it's all low power stuff. Yeah. So it's not like some high power phenomenon because it's it's literally a mix of the signals and waves of, of the fashion that you yeah have yeah. derived them. So so it's interesting. It's all in the waves. So this. The whole thing went on for about four months, and I relocated after they left to Burnaby, British Columbia, to another industrial space. Now, was that your own space there? That was my own, my own space. Did you get to bring any of that equipment with you? It was loaded up. So, you, so the Los Alamos stuff you got to bring with you to that? Oh, no, no. They oh, this me. was... Go ahead. This another... Yeah. They took all their own test equipment. Yeah. Oh. Video stuff back. Boo! Yeah, <laughs> no, that's a property. Okay. So you got a new industrial space. Yep. And I was getting uh, two hundred dollars a day in cash, by the way, folks. <laughs> two hundred dollars a day. Yeah. In what year? Eighty-three. On eighty-three. Yeah. That's a gold mine. Gold mine, good money, really good money. Yeah, they must have wanted your information. That's the bad thing. Did, they said, did you feel like you were being paid for your information? Or did you feel like they wanted to actually find out something important? I think I, I felt that they explained to me that they felt the Russians said something similar. Um, and my cooperation would be prevent a kind of a problem with the free world and an attack from the Soviets kind of thing. Okay. So that's what I was told by the current. That's what you were told, yeah. And I thought, well, what do you know? This is kind of an adventure, really. <laughs> Your, your life is in military. Okay, high priority, President Reagan. Oh, cool. Okay, the heck, I <laughs> live once, so yeah. But uh, it's a strange period of life. My mother passed away on that in that time frame, and my brother came and brother-in-law came and picked me up from the lab, industrial building. And they say, okay, you can go. And I went back to my parents' place. That's a long story behind that, too. But anyway, I stayed the day and I, uh, I just went back and said, look, a healthy thing for me to do is just keep on going. So we continued on. And after many months, um, they packed up and I relocated to Burnaby, BC, and rebuilt up the um, huge labs where yet other visitors would be coming. One would be uh, the first one is a journalist friend of mine. He um, since the gun control issue, he's covered my story then, and he got word of it. He came around and he said, "Wow, this is like Frankenstein <laughs> and stuff. You know, this is really cool." 
And I, you know, we were talking about what happens and all that. Yeah. I think we can. Okay, what I'm going to do is uh, get our engineers to test the cameras so they won't get damaged in this stuff. I don't want to do a special on it. Okay. The news for the news hour. I said, sure, why not? So he comes down. We're up to now 1985. Comes down. That's when I was born, by the way. Hmm? I was born in 85. You were? I'm a little kid still. <laughs> <laughs> little kid somewhere out there. In Indiana, I guess. Uh huh. Wow. <laughs> so, wow. So, we did a demonstration for Sick O'Clock News. And it worked out just perfect. I laugh at it. I mean, I look like a goof. Smoking <laughs> my pipe and that. Uh, <laughs> and it was a big hit. I got a lot of mail and film offers. Okay. Of course, that hit. That news also put George Hathaway and Alex Bazzaro. In the news oh, as well? Oh, no! <laughs> Whoops! <laughs> Not in the news. They came flying out and the Canadian government got involved. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister Eric Nielsen got a group of scientists together. And just because they were interested in the phenomenon of the light. Oh, yeah. they, 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 they flew out and they covered all day long with all the cameras they could muster at that day. One day. Oh, they just did one day's worth? And they um, classified it. A matter of national security. Still classified? Yeah, I can't get a hold of it. Oh. Huh. I had a. Um, oh, I should mention his name. Yeah, don't do that. A friend of mine in 2005 tried to find that. He is a war fighter in Afghanistan, Special Forces. He went. To, uh, we, he spent a weekend with me in 2005. We went over some of the stuff he was going through in Afghanistan. We were up all night. We had a lot of fun. And. Okay, so he managed to contact Colonel Tim Deere, who talked about my stuff. Then he had to go back to DARPA to do something, and he got fired. Don't want to told. Then he went back to Afghanistan. There's a lot of gaps that I don't know about. But recent contact was maybe a few months ago. Anyway, it's just the area is weird. The uh, Americans who visited me are more open. They appear on TLC TV shows or Fox News or whatever it is. The Canadians, nothing. Zero. Nothing. They, they don't nothing. want to be public. Nothing. Nothing. They came, but they didn't want to be public. No public. I got their letters. Yeah. That I made public. <laughs> <laughs> got a lot of letters from them, but no way that they, they want to release that information. So. Okay, so the, jumping back to 85, 86, there was two other TV groups that came down and filmed. CKBU Television and the CBC Canadian Broadcasting Corporation came down and filmed this feature on it. And then I have all those tapes. Then, after that, McDonnell Douglas Aerospace came down and did a controlled experiment for two days, and I, luckily I got that video that I just recently uploaded on Daily Motion. Okay. And after that, I broke ties with Ferris Technologies and slowly got involved with another group that had their own funders from Boeing Aerospace Corporation. So this whole time, so far, mm -hmm. they're still just trying to figure out that levitating, melting metal phenomenon. This whole entire time. Yeah, they uh, would write reports on it, they would speculate on it, and I had these reports. They couldn't figure out how it was done and why these transmutations would affect, take effect. Okay. Another scientist group, friends of mine, that are kind of opposites with the Hathaway group, Ken Shoulders, he uh, was very interested in what he was doing and felt he had. <laughs> a lot of uh, information. I met Ken in 1995. He bought some metal samples for me for analysis. We kept in contact. I met in Los Angeles in 1997. Again, met in New Westminster again. And just recently, it was 2013, Nancy and I went to visit Ken. He passed away a day after from cancer. But I'm just trying to say there's so many um, interesting folks involved in all this stuff. Yeah. That, um, 
you know, I'll talk about something and then something else is starting yep, to Yeah, trigger something else. He wants to try it's and get it. It's all good. It's all good. Spit it out. <laughs> so, oh, God, yeah, and then see if I lose track because so many different things I'm thinking about at the same time. I had defense contractors come down and look at a demonstration in business suits and they gave me a hundred bucks saying, that was fantastic. <laughs> I'm kidding. They just wanted to see it? Because after the fairest thing, I was open to anybody coming in to do whatever they want. So I, I okay. can try to show. So you went so you went through these stages. Even even in um, the Expo eighty six presentation in Vancouver. I had my own space where they gave me my own space in at in the anchor dome kind of building. Okay. Did you set that experiment up there? Yeah. And you got it to sure, work? Sure, no, off to the people, yeah. So so Thousands. <laughs> they didn't like the sound though. Okay, because it's, it's it's is it it's audible. Yeah. But there's a lot that's outside the audible range too. Yeah, right. Yeah. That was for I still got I think I still got the promotional sheet on that. It was on the news too. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah, it was a riot because here I am actually on a stage with a huge um, um, stadium with thousands of people. You know, they're doing their thing on the on the ground and. The uh, presentator for coming in around all that, and they have the uh, the vans like CK or uh, CK and W News. And I got spot said, can, "Can you do sixty minutes, like sixty or not sixty, 60 seconds of a of a promotional message to the people?" Said, yeah, okay. Shit, <laughs> Jay, time. You know, that's fun. <laughs> I had a lot of fun. Had a lot of fun. Yeah, which is good. Nineteen ninety-six. I always tell people, if you ain't having fun, you're doing something wrong. So. <laughs> A lot of stuff, a lot of adventures, and so, well, I had a lot of input from this whole weird path of mine. It led me to one of Tesla's friends, which is his name is Thomas Lee Richardson, <coughs> who I met in person in Vancouver on 20th Avenue and Main Street area above. And his house was literally full of Tesla's books, Tesla's publication, Tesla's furniture. And I, I didn't overreact to that. I thought it was unusual, of course. And Thomas would point out things. What year? What year was that? Oh, that's uh, eighty-seven. Eighty-seven time frame, eighty-eight. Okay, so in that time frame. It's in the Murchies T Building, downtown Vancouver, and yet another lab space with Al Industries. But for a couple of years, Thomas Lee and I were in contact, visiting each other. And Thomas would come into my lab and say, this is reminded him of what happened, what's going on in the New York area. What was going on in New York? Tesla's lab on Okay. And it's interesting, I can verify this because I have enough information because Thomas Lee Richards would talk to a broadcaster, famous broadcaster on uh, BC TV News, and that was, um, oh, Jack Webster, and very famous. Because Thomas showed me all the tapes he had of his conversations with Jack Webster about Tesla. And when um, Thomas was getting ill, age related issues, uh, Peter Jovic, myself, Stan Regic, and others, and Peter Jovic, Steve Turner. We all knew and kind of protected um, Thomas Lee Richardson. So what we wanted to do was try and save this house full of this valuable material. Mm -hmm. But we were denied permission to do so by the provincial government because this is Mr. We don't know who this belongs to. Or, or was that in Canada? Was in Canada? He was yeah. in Canada. Yeah, it's Vancouver, Canada. Okay. And the other good thing is I do have a few documents from Thomas Lee Richardson, as well as Thomas Lee Richardson has published books on Tesla that recently I found in the Vancouver Public Library through a librarian's help in Canada. Okay. And so it's not a fictional person. Yeah. <laughs> Another interesting character that I contacted me was uh, a banker by the name of Lawrence St. Ives. I have his phone number. Phone me. How I got my number, I don't know, but his great aunt was Tesla's secretary. When she passed away, all the papers on the earthquake machine 
were taken up, auctioned off. And he was on the paper chase. Trying, trying to, to figure out where it went. Yeah. He was to meet me. Um, Mr. Pike, his name was Lawrence A. Nice. So, so what happened to the stuff that was in his apartment? Tesla's papers and all sorts of stuff. That uh, Thomas Lee Richardson had? Yeah. I was told by Cantor Realty on Granville Street, later on, it's kind of the last communication I had, with, that it was shipped over to the United Kingdom. When, when, what, what year was that? Oh, that would have to be been 88 times. So, it, so it's been a good while. Yeah. Cause Thomas, so who knows? Yeah. I mean, it's a, you'd think somebody would pick up on it. Uh, yeah. And say, this is Tesla stuff, this should be in a museum or... Something documented somewhere, kept somewhere safe. Just really weird. So you got to see some of this paperwork. Yeah, a lot of it I couldn't understand. I don't understand equations. Okay, so a lot of it was written in equations. Some was mathematical. Written, uh, handwritten documents. Okay, but was a lot of it mathematical then? There was some math in some of the stuff, and Thomas was very protective of it. Okay. He would show me some of it's like a uh, a book that was only half full of. Stuff in the rest of my pages, you know. Huh. And there was a mirror, uh, like a, a mirror of Tesla. Big thing like that. Silver inlay, or whatever you call it, hanging on one of the walls. It was on the furniture. I just don't... <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just one of those things, well, what do you do? Um, Thomas um, would love to talk about Tesla. And he probably talked to me about a lot of things I probably forgot about, but probably quite important. But he also talked to uh, Jack Webster, as I mentioned. Do Peter, you, Joe, Vic, Stan, Regic, uh, Steve Turner. Do you remember anything in particular that you read through that was stuck in your head that you... A lot of diagrams. They're stuck in your head, aren't they? Yeah. Still got them? Got a good photographic memory of them? Kind of, yeah. They were like antenna structures. Did you build some of them? Not from those notes, no. Not from those notes. Because later, at the same time, in that time time frame, became available a lot of Tesla stuff that you could buy. Oh. To cover a lot of different things. Okay. In books and stuff. Yeah. Okay. So I read some of Tesla's own um, publications. Yeah. That uh, are available to the public, and I go into what he's trying to think and build. Yeah. And that helped me quite a bit, too. So that... You already did a lot of the levitation experiments, though, prior to really looking at that information, right? Yeah. So did any of that information help you with your current work? Oh, a lot of trial and error, a lot of research into other people's research, like Steinmetz, um, as well as getting help from the Ferris Technologies, uh, Alex Bizzaro, Joe Tathaway would be looking at everything and share with me what they would be finding. Okay. So this, so let me ask you this. This was an accidental discovery. Correct. After you figured out that everyone else was so interested in it. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> right? <laughs> After that, did you try to work solely on that and dedicate, I want to see this levitator, I want to see this manipulate, like, did you focus all of your time and energy on doing that? Or was your interest still more based on, like, the functionality of the equipment? You know, how did you, I mean, maybe I could ask it better, like, your interest originally was the functionality of the equipment. Yeah, and trying to even reproduce some of this stuff. Okay, and so, so, so then after that, you were trying to reproduce your own phenomenon, basically. That's a side effect, yeah, and I improved it, though. Okay. So did you under do you did you understand what you had to do to get that to work? Uh, with help of, and suggestions by other scientists over time, yes, it did help. Some of their information did help. Okay. But going by visual and instinct, that really helped. That was that was the primary. Yeah, because I really had to really get it my act together. Oh, because I did lose the lab. The lab was seized by the Canadian government when I tried to go, move it to Germany. And that's a huge long story. <laughs> that's, <laughs> I was with my lady uh, Yin, actually her granddad, a great inventor, uh, Antoine Gast. I actually looked him up on the internet to see what he invents. And I got to see the actual house where he lived in. But uh, Yin went back to Hollywood 
um, cause the stuff was seized and going to be shipped to Germany, but it was not, so I lived in Germany for two years in Austria. Okay. Came back, Yen came back after she did a few films, and we got together and got this apartment. And then I'd be traveling to LA quite a bit to visit Yen. Well, Yen stayed with me for a while. We went to Egypt and went back to Austria to help her sister out. Because Peter, Dr. Peter Kukushnik, like, who's a Tesla scientist as well, passed away, and that's where I was staying for a short time. Okay. He was a true genius, and I think I have some of his stuff here that Dr. Margarita gave me in 1993. But, uh, so, because the idea was for me to actually move and live in, in Europe. Yeah. But the land was taken by the Canadian government, made the front page of the news stories again. I'd love to get the video footage of that. I'm sure it made a lot of news that, but you know, it's just a matter of the stuff being put away some of it. Yeah, somebody somewhere's got it in the back of a something somewhere and it's in the basement difficult Langer. to get. Yeah, it's getting difficult to figure out who that person is and where to get it. That alone would take a lifetime. You can spend a lifetime just trying to recover your old footage. Uh, things that you've been through. Make a damn, I'm having a damn good laugh now. Uh, yeah. So I rebuilt the lab. After these industrial settings, after the um, Al Industries Group. This is when you moved into the apartment? When I moved into the apartment. Is that the same time frame? When you came back from Germany, Egypt, you moved into that apartment? Yeah, I had in Vancouver. A, a year or two at my sister's until I reestablished when Yen and I got into an apartment. Okay. <clears throat> now, once you left, after about a year going back to Hollywood, she couldn't stand the Westminster of the Energy there, and that's her action that's to film the X Files a few blocks away. <laughs> I mean, I had to, when I'm going outside to the Navy ships, I had to go around the block. They have a whole block cordon off. They had two shows, the, the X Files and the Millennium. They had that so the, the Navy ships that you would get stuff all for, you had to go through that area to get. Yeah, because I had to go around this way and down, so I always run into a film set halfway. <laughs> all around the media and there's it's like you're vortex into it <laughs> it's like, yeah it seems like a good grief but you know when okay so i think that i love the warships a good exercise i love the physical activity the ability to do anything i want on these navy ships yeah how did you get that well somebody told me you know they're taking apart navy ships down there for what artificial be Think, think, think oh, they were doing it for artificial reef yeah. purposes. Yeah, so oh. uh, so he tells me this, this guy in the alley tells me that. So I go, okay, go to the bank, cash something, go back to my place to think about this. Okay, it's a bit late now, but early in the morning I'm going down there. So I went down there and it's a big, big destroyer. That's pretty crazy. Okay. <laughs> what the hell? You know, I, okay, I'm, I'm asking questions. Oh, yeah, we just simply scratch this. Okay, what is it? I'm going to sit down on this dock and I'm going to start stripping metal for scrap. And I did. So, I determined I want to get on that ship. So. Oh, so they wouldn't let you on? Not yet. Okay. They didn't know me. They didn't, okay. They had, make, they, had make, they had to make some friends first. So I started doing my stuff, put the pile aside, and I said, here, I'm going to have to tire myself and throw me in, in, in the salt chuck, I don't care, but... <laughs> so they got to, um, I helped Wayne out, if you need something lifted up, it was on top of everything, and, and West Roots, a project manager, that kept saying, that man's got to be hired! <laughs> <laughs> so eventually I got to meet West Roots. Okay. I said, West, look, uh, I'm a crazy scientist, I, get, I got funding from the gym. Japan, a quarter of a mil in the bank. To me, this is exercise, and for me, it's a lot of fun. I'm into the environmental stuff. I scrap many things, see many objects. Put your hands, go to it. <laughs> so he just lets you go in there and just strip all the equipment out? He put me in charge. Yeah, he put me in charge of all the electronics, meaning sonar, radar, communications, and, okay. and the cannons and artillery and armaments. So. Okay. Your two hot spots. Oh, yeah. You were in heaven, weren't you? Oh, God, yeah. You were but, loving uh, it. And I worked, uh, I worked, and I didn't have lunch. I don't like lunch. 
And as time passed, that ship went out. It was used in the Exiles, uh, Dodd Con, I believe, where they're growing old in that ship. And they sprayed paint everything all over. It was a big mess. But <laughs> And then uh, Columbia came in. And they used Columbia for uh, the submarine story. <clears throat> and so that was a ship that didn't have a destroyer extension life project. It's all vintage old stuff that um, from the 50s which I did haul a lot of that up the hill, but by this time they gave me my own room. So I could do anything I wanted, I could stay over there either. At the ship you were at, the, at the place where you were at? Yeah. At the ship, you mean? On the ship? Yeah. Okay. So I keep bankers, hours, locked down. So when you you told me earlier you, you set up a taxi cab to get some of this back to your apartment? Was this the, oh. same, time, is this the same time frame? This is another time frame. When oh, I, this is another time frame. Uh, in the 70s, I found a gigantic 90-millimeter um, anti-aircraft gun I couldn't live without. And it was trying to be scrapped, but it caused havoc with the giant springs in it. Oh. So, um, it actually caused the death of some person, which I read in newspapers. But I knew about this. That they were trying to get it apart for scrapping? Yeah, the, yeah, uh, see, the air cadet sold it to Amex Salvage. For a mere two hundred bucks, <laughs> and I've talked to him. And so to heard about the accidents, you know, this is, they said that they took the springs out at the airport and blah blah blah. And I said, okay, um, can I buy it? You can have it. We deal in hundreds of tons of steel every year. You can have it. We're right your like, You can have it. We don't want anything to do with that thing. <laughs> okay, now I have permission. So I come down with my wrenches. <clears throat> And next thing I know, the um, army's up. We're going in the army, we're going to phone down Excel, which is like, okay. So they confirmed that I owned it. Do whatever you want, you know, kind of attitude. So I got involved in this and I thought, well, North Shore Taxi, because I'll have a heavy load. I can't carry this on the bus. Right, okay. I mean, I have carried machine guns on, like, on the bus. <laughs> oh, yeah, 50 Brownings with a duffel bag around it. <laughs> It was in the days when people weren't paranoid or anything. Yeah, exactly. But this stuff is bulky and heavy and it's hundreds of pounds. It's 50, probably 80 pounds a night. Anyway, so the taxi would come pick me up, go back to my place. And this is going for a month or two, I think. And it was a riot. I was pulling up stuff and I was rebuilding it in, in my industrial space. And wow. My mistake and stupidity, really, in all this, I should have just actually called up a, a rigger, take the whole gun over to the land ladies' place and keep it. Yeah. To this day, right now, there's a little war going on with my friends in Canada with this gun. Really? It's, it's hidden away. The guy doesn't want to show it off to my buddy, <laughs> childhood buddy, who's a gun collector like me, because I can recognize, I said, I know exactly what parts of that piece. Okay. And that's a lot of years. Yeah. And luckily I even have it on B when BCTV was filming. They actually got some of the gun pieces because they rebuilt the traverse mechanism, the elevation mechanism. Okay. Look at that, guys. <laughs> Those guys kind of hiding away. No, I'm not going to show you. I'm not going to show you. Anyway. Yeah. So. Okay. Skip that time for now. I just thought that was an interesting part of it. Set up, you, pre you pretty much set up a taxi to be there on a schedule and you just scheduled your day that way. I had one time get a, a moving truck. It's a 400 pound piece. <laughs> so as the years passed, of course, going from that location, Wind Valley, to Burnaby, then to other locations in New Westminster, going to the Navy ships in the 90s, 95, 94, 95, up to 2000. I had a, I would call a cab, unless the project manager sometimes would give me a lift up the hill. But then, good old North Shore taxi would call, not North Shore, but New West cab. He recognized my voice right away and said, the ship? <laughs> yep. Because <laughs> some days I was too tired to walk up that hill with this load of stuff. Uh, yeah. Man, really in reality, I, I'm kind of an urgent person, I need to walk. I can't sit there, you know, it's just strike one. If it's in front of me, it's gone. I want to take it. Yeah. So. Tomorrow it might not be there, even though it's not going anywhere. You know, I even have my own room where I can lock it up. It's a yeah. war measures room. 
You feel, you feel safe when it's at your your place, at your location. Talk about neurotic I am with this stuff, but I am. That's just part of who I am, I guess. But that's not. I had to get it up the hill, um, and the bigger stuff. I left because the project manager would get the forklift and haul it out the side of the ship down and take it up the hill. And luckily, I had a very, very supportive ex Navy. Um, Landlord. Sure. So it was great. So he was he was loving it too. Oh, he was crazy. So we have to shore up your apartment and all this, you know. That's the one in Vancouver. That's in the Westminster Bridge, Columbia. Yeah. The one with you had all stuff on the the deck. Yeah. Okay, so so the actual complex owner was excited about it. He was like, "Go for it." Yeah. Okay, he so says, that makes more sense now. Yeah. He was that he was that way. He says he didn't. He thought. This is all BS. I want, if you can arrange to get the deck guns up here. I'll try, but they like to try and sing. And I thought, what a waste of antiques. <laughs> so I got some of the gun parts up the hill. <laughs> and my job, I dismantle it from <coughs> the back guns first, usually, and then the front guns for 70,000 moving parts. And I got a video of that. Wow. And that metal supplied all the money needed to pay the crew and take them, the ship apart, the rest of it. Really? So, I mean, I had a plan where, yeah, good impressions always good. Be here, work hard, don't take too many breaks. So I would do, undo all these hundreds and hundreds of bolts and let the, everything sit. You know, Wes would come around maybe once a day and look at him. See, you're progressing, okay? Yep. Mm -hmm. Let me know if you need anybody or a clean crew to come in and help. So, that one more day, so I have a few more endless bolts. Then I pull out some of the main membered solid aluminum beams. And it goes crashing down. <laughs> then number two, number three and four. Whew, what a rush that was. I sometimes either come along. Hold it. Here's all this metal. Fairly clean. I go walking up. <coughs> Wes, hi, Lava. Yeah, I'm kind of free, John. Cleaning crew time. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> oh my god. How'd you it. do that? <laughs> As an engineer, it's like Scotty oh, and Star Trek and never show this, give them the proper time for him. That's fine. So he was so happy, it meant money for the uh, crew. He was too, actually too happy because he loaded up a van too much and it broke it. <laughs> and Raleigh went Overloaded away. the van? It's all your fault. But he was joking in a joking way. He would be. That's funny. But yeah, that was um, that part. So, so <laughs> let's, let's move forward in time. Okay. You're in your apartment, so all of this big laboratory, big people, big scientists trying to figure this stuff out. You still have visitors at that. At your apartment, some oh, pretty big, big people that still were interested in what you were doing. <clears throat> but you yeah. stayed in your apartment. You didn't get any outside labs or anything like that, right? Uh, what's it? See, I'm inside the apartment, uh, I have a lot of girlfriends. <laughs> I have a lot of girlfriends. And and that's when the switches aren't turned on, except for one time when the Japanese came up. But <laughs> it got where I was doing these tests in, in the apartment, which. At that time, too, there was a lot of film crews that came in from history, Fox, even... Yeah, uh, most of the footage you see is all when you're in that apartment. Yeah, and, and I'd invite them, and they'd come, and they would film, and different countries would come and film. And my main um, networks, Discovery Channel, Fox, NBC, and they'd come film. And man, it was good money. They would pay you to come film? They would pay me a thousand to sell. To, to come in there and do the, do the film. So they would film, and then they'd always need archived footage, which my um, agent had, where I did a TV show with him. It's <coughs> called Beyond Invention, Beyond Invention Wiki, look it up. Okay, yeah. It was a hit. And prior to that was, of course, TLC, it was another hit. So Peter decided that he would sell all my footage for $75 per second. Wow. And man, I, you know, I made good money. One day, Japanese bought 40,000 in footage. 
one day. Jeez. So I was. Uh, was it the same footage you sell to different people? But Peter would arrange it where he, you know, I'd say, you want footage, you have to talk to Peter. <laughs> so I did, I forget how many Bermuda Triangle stories. I don't care, I don't care what the story is. <laughs> let's film, let's have fun, <clears throat> and let's make a good thing go there on History Channel or, or Slox or whatever. And I was having a lot of fun doing that, and I was so busy doing it that I pre tuned all the equipment in that apartment. And brought up all the cables to one giant junction box that I took this, got rid of the stove, everything was stripped out of that apartment. So I had these plugs I could push in. So, and everything that turned itself on, I didn't have to do any adjustment. So when they came, they filmed, they interviewed me, got the B roll stuff, bought footage from Peter, and I was done in a day. Now, I did get a feature thing done. It was uh, for six months. It was Ark of the Covenant. A ref actually, a very refreshing, different topic. <coughs> I was approached by um, the United Kingdom company for Discovery Channel. They did a previous show with them. It's 2005, 2004. A proposal was given to me to build an Ark of the Covenant, a working Titan. I said, okay, well, I'll do it. We'll worry about problems later, do it now. <laughs> <laughs> so they uh, wired me $16,000. And everything in the U.S. seemed to come together. I found a master craftsman, woodmaker, who had on stock lots of cases of wood. And then um, he was happy to do it. Peter was actually happy to film it in part. And then there was uh, Renee Barnett, Rudy Fishman, who camera operator, who works on TLC. So we all got together and put six months in building this Ark of the Covenant. A great grand finale, and I had a lot of fun. Every, not every day, a lot of days are high activity. You have to go to this location film. Okay. The scrap yard, here John is running <coughs> pieces, and then another location, a test run. And all in all, got, um, but out of 52 hours of editing down to 45 or 48 for TLC and it aired in 2008. Then I got copies of it and I uploaded on YouTube. So that's one of the long ones. That was a lot of fun. It was kind of refreshing. It wasn't a levitation stuff too much. Yeah, it was something different. <clears throat> yeah. So, so... And I did a lot of free energy things too. Yeah, what's the, what's the story with... You were trying to do something with mechanical free energy? Hmm, mechanical free energy? Yeah. I, What's... I looked at the, all the mechanical free energy stuff. And Did you build stuff? I built only one. I was trying to replicate the Alexander generator. So it was a rotary device. And what I built didn't really work that well. And somebody in, in West Vancouver had um, one supposedly built by Alexander. Well, how did you get interested in the free energy? You went from well, doing levitation stuff into doing free energy stuff. Well, right? it's kind of on a sideline. I was in free energy in the 60s. Okay. Because I had a, a radio. I was always in tune to a radio station playing all the popular songs, and I got sick of buying these batteries. So, <laughs> this is just a good motivation. I made this strange little box that harvest, an uh, energy harvesting unit, and I made it fancy by having two gauges on one for milliampers, one for volts. I used, uh, I believe, an old leather strap, a belt. Here I am carrying this radio around, up to this box. What the hell's that? <laughs> They're at it. What is this? You know, that's... It wasn't out to promote anything. This is this only something I wanted to... Uh, what was in the box? I have a set of co resonant coils I built. So you built a set of resonant coils? You pick up ambient RF and convert any usable electricity to drive a capacitor, which would drive the radio, so I was happy. Okay, so you were, really using, happy. you were using the couple thousand watts of transmission power as a wireless receiver uh -huh. from the radio stations. The radio stuff, ambient sparks and things like that, um, AC, hum. Uh, it worked out for a while, and um, 
that things in life change, of course I go somewhere else, move somewhere else. <laughs> Different frequencies. <laughs> and, and I was building an insane asylum, uh, in <laughs> a very powerful one that actually burnt my face and that the doctor was very angry with me. Really? How, how did it burn your face? It was emitting a UV ultraviolet radiation. Okay. So the doctor came over. No. <laughs> Your doctor said, no, you can't. You, here's I cups some brassic acid. You don't play with that stuff in here. Well, what was the device, though? It's some kind of radiant energy thing I got from the ideas of Mori. Of Mori? Yeah. So, do you remember? Can you describe it? It had a blue light coming out of it. That's what I can describe. It <laughs> had a lot of antenna wires. Okay. And it was it the same mercury. thing. It had a lot of mercury in it too. Really? Yeah. But okay, so was this device receiving the radio transmissions and doing the same conversion? I think it was picking up something else. And what was that? And I think it was probably zero point. Okay. Something I read in about mercury and clay and coils and. And it was Murray. Murray's. I didn't get a chip. I didn't. Did you? T. Uh, Henry Murray. How did you find that? Did he have a book? You read his book? Yeah, there's some old, yeah, there's old books around on that. Okay. A lot of it, because the uh, Crease Clinic Library, Reese C. Fox, Muller, and Andrew Hoffman, <laughs> had a huge uh, library. And a lot of old books I'd go into, reading up on ancient things that they had a lot of. So, okay. you get ideas, go up to the electronic shop up the hill. Get <laughs> <laughs> Guess I could use that. <laughs> no, really, I did this. I don't ever miss it. So I was kind of nasty that way too. <laughs> and he had a lot of good old stuff up there. <laughs> so I did sneak off or borrow, I extended we, borrow. We extendedly borrowed something. And he was on with me one time. And, oh, I had to retaliate. I had a gallon thing that she blew up out of his gas tank. <laughs> this is all true, folks. Trust me. <laughs> is this guy still alive? I don't think so. I hope not. <laughs> I hope not that. It was a riot. It was a friend of mine, um, David Prince, and he and I were into this free energy stuff quite a bit. And this is alongside of doing crazy other things. I said your folks. levitation and everything else. This was also. What you were interested in at, at those times? Yeah, I mean, at, at that age, I mean, at, at Happy Acres was, what, was it, 60s, late 60s. So, I mean, we had a lot of fun. We'd get dry ice and throw it in the women's toilet and hide it upstairs. And, Ooh, there's something wrong with the toilet! <laughs> yeah, we laugh our hands off. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. We just almost wet ourselves because they come. You, they open the doors. You see all the smoke coming out. We're on one the floor. The nurse is running in. Like, we don't know what it is. <laughs> so your free energy. You worked on that besides some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me what. Okay, you, you, everybody knows you for the crystal cell battery type of thing, you know, if you look that up, your name's going to come up. Yeah. So, where did you get started in that, though? Like, how did you, where, what? So, well, why would you take a bunch of minerals and mix it up and, uh, I mean, what? I got, where did you start with that? Okay, we're kind of jumping through the, well, quite a, Ahead of time? No, that's okay, because the free energy stuff, that in the early days, I just needed it because I needed a power supply to run a transistor radio group. Well, but before we jump ahead then, what other type of free energy devices did you construct? You did one that took up ambient radio noise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was something else that you constructed? Mostly ambient detectors. Uh, did I... Um, yeah, just basically ambient detectors. And what does an ambient detector do and how does it work? Convert ambient all the whole wide spectrum of electromagnetics <coughs> down to a narrow point where it's captured, stored, and used as a uh, power source for milliwatts. Well, how, how does that work though? Like, what's the... Basically, diodes. You would use diodes? Different diodes. 
and then come down to Oh yeah, you, this is the one we started earlier with the diode. You had mentioned it. You mm -hmm. had mentioned this earlier with the diode. In, I, I think it was related to this, where you, you were using it in this fashion. Oh, that's the, uh, the, no, the uh, diode um, that I probably mentioned was about the fuel, fuel stress detector. Yes, okay, so this is something different. Yeah, so you would use conventional diodes. So you use diodes and configure them how? Oh, it's just little bands of them, different categories of them. So they would take ambient energy, accumulate, collect, and the diodes would actually convert it into DC that would be load up a hefty capacitor, a very sensitive low inductance capacitor. Okay. They're hard to find, and a self-reactive capacitor hard to find too. Okay. But I was lucky, I, I was relentless in my search in these surplus stores. Well, so this device though, you would take a bunch of diodes to rectify the incoming signal. You, you would have an antenna of some kind? Yeah. Or a coil? Uh, yeah, more of a coil loop antenna on the outside. Okay. And that was pretty much the device though. Yeah. A loop antenna converted to DC and stored in a capacitor. Yeah. And that, that's... A transistor radio. Okay. Now that signal coming in, it was ambient. Do you think it was more radio signals coming in that you were seeing? Or was it the ambient? Like what do you describe as ambient? Oh, well, cause there is uh, radio signals up and down the band, all over the bands. Um, VHF, mm -hmm. right down to ELF, if you need to say that. Also, there's an uh, AC hum in the air, the static in the air. That's just a general energy scavenging device that... Uh... So, let me ask you this. Pretend like there was no ambient noise from our industrial... Or even know, broadcasting. Or even broadcasting. Yeah. Outside of all of that, right? what is there in the air that's the um, energy that's in cosmic, the air? Cosmic rays. Okay. And zero point energy fluctuation. Okay. And z we describe zero point and ambient fluctuations. Describe it? Yeah, can you describe that? CP, way at the very end, I got a beautiful video on that that my business partner made. Right? Uh, it's at the very end of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay. It's squared energy. It's squared energy. And endless power. One inch, or one inch, but one, one ounce could boil off the oceans of the earth. So, how how can you how do you how would you describe that energy? Like, is it is it is it a, it's a wave, or is it actually like energy is in its pure form, or it's more in its pure form? I don't know. It's just it's immense as you go up the electromagnetic spectrum to the end of it. The power levels increase exponentially. Unbelievable power. And so this chart that you're describing, right? Yeah, it would go. It would, yeah, it would go to that spectrum, right? But, square. but that chart is a wave chart, a, a frequency chart, right? I think so, yeah. Or, or do you, would you see it as something different? Well, I could call it a wave, but is it really? It could be something different. Maybe somebody else would say it's different. I don't know, but I no. call it a wave. You would call it a wave. Sick arguments, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, how does that wave, how, let me ask you this, how does a electromagnetic wave propagate? You've got Tesla's longitudinal waves. Right. You've got um, transverse waves. So, when you get to that energy level, what kind of wave is that? How does it travel? Is it stagnant? We talked about static. It's not, no, it's dynamic. It's dynamic. Yeah. Okay. It can be captured between two little plates. This is a very crude thing that scientists like to talk about, like Dr. Pudock and others. <clears throat> There's energy that seems to pull these plates together. I guess a dramatic demonstration, if you use engineering blocks and put them together, you'll notice that... They don't want to come apart. They don't want to come apart. And, okay, so you start researching up ways of trying to catch it. So I looked up petroelectric effect, T-Town and bronze work. Connect canoe wax and minerals, okay. I'll go out in other areas of old timers that have done it already. Think good idea. I, I a lot of the time a lot of stuff doesn't work what I make. Back to the drawing board kind of thing. Mm-hmm.